Hi, I'm Lance Cottrell, Chief Scientist at Intrepid, and this is the Intrepid Cast. So I wanted to put together a set of the most important tips I have for performing online investigations based on our over 20 years of experience in building these kinds of platforms and supporting online anonymous and undercover activities. Now, there's a lot of things that online investigations have in common with any other kind of investigation, right? It's important to be working quickly. You've got to have plans, priorities, you've got to persevere. You don't want to be necessarily tipping your hand, and you may need to use appropriate forensic tools to gather whatever kind of information you've got. Most of those apply in the normal way to online investigations, but specifically avoiding notice and the tools you're going to be using are substantially different. And so I'm going to be focusing this talk on those areas specifically. So the first question is, why do you need to investigate online? I think probably that's not a case that needs to be made too hard, but really it's amazing how it's transformed the criminal sort of landscape. You know, drug sales, a ton of drug sales have moved online. We're seeing massive cases of Medicare fraud taking place primarily over the internet. There's all kinds of criminal marketplaces where uh, malware, hacking tools, credit card numbers, uh, as well as drugs and other kind of paraphernalia and capabilities are all being sold on these criminal souks and marketplaces online, you know, leading to something like 300,000 people losing over $1.4 billion to online scams and frauds. And it's an interesting haven for criminals. Uh, because of the cyber environment, in many cases, it's safer for them to operate online than it is doing conventional crimes, uh, often because it allows them to be outside of the United States, right? They can commit these crimes from somewhere safe. They don't need to be right next to you to try to do these kinds of activities. And finally, in many cases, it's easier to do the scam online because it requires less support, right? You don't need to look the part, you just need to sound the, the part. And so that can make it much easier to conduct these kind of activities. But I think at the end of the day, the most important aspect is that almost every crime has an online component these days. Even if we're just talking mapping how you're getting to uh, the place you're committing the crime or setting up the time or recruiting your, your allies, it's always going to have some aspect of an online uh, interaction as part of whatever other activity they're engaging in. So let's dig in a little bit. What's really different about the online environment from ordinary investigations that, that you all are conducting all the time? I think the first is that it is an unfamiliar and rapidly evolving environment. You know, I remember not so many years ago that the internet was entirely accessed through those online AOL CDs that they mailed out all the time. And I was never in need of uh, coasters around my house because I had thousands of these things. Whereas now there's websites all of all kinds. There's virtual reality sites. There's social media coming and going. Uh, there's new protocols, new platforms. Uh, some of these really are completely upending the status quo on a regular Facebook. Uh, on a regular basis. Uh, for example, think that about Facebook. And before Facebook, there was Friendster and MySpace, and hardly anyone even remembers that those exists anymore. And there, you know, cell phones have transferred how, when, where we interact online. There's encrypted message apps that are popping up and replacing each other all the time that are allowing people to communicate securely in different ways over different media. And this is happening on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. So there's no sort of street plan. You get used to in the real world, you know, the street plan of New York is largely the street plan that it was 50 years ago. The street plan of the internet looks nothing like it did 10, 15 years ago. Right? Everything changes so fast. The other big difference online is just how tracked we are. You know, in the real world, occasionally there's cameras, you might be able to go grab some footage from the bar, but online, literally everything is tracked all the time. Anytime you touch any server on the internet, it's leaving a record. And when we're looking at web pages, it isn't just the site you're visiting that's tracking you. In fact, there may be upwards of 20 other companies that have trackers embedded on that website for 
advertising, for uh, usage tracking, for you know, aggregate analytics about their users. Uh, even the social media like buttons that are on there are tied back to those corporations and allow them to see your activity across the entire internet. And of course, we've all seen this when you go to a shopping website, look at something, and then suddenly that item is you know, tracking you like some sort of ghost across the rest of the internet. Everywhere you go, that, that tire chain is appearing um, and haunting you. But it also has sort of practical issues for us as investigators because the bad guys are making use of this information. They're identifying us and they've actually set up websites. This is a real website out there, who's a rat.com, devoted for criminals to identify law enforcement attorneys, people that could be problems to them, collecting information about who they are, what's their name, where do they work, what are their areas of responsibility, what are their IP addresses, so that you can actually configure your website to automatically recognize when anyone on these lists shows up and either block them or, for more sophisticated opponents, actually provide misinformation. Right? They'll alter the website to hide or change the information you see if you look like someone they don't want to have visiting there. The internet's also very technical in terms of the things you need to be thinking about when conducting investigations. Uh, and often it's not the investigator's core competency. Right? We work with people all the time who are you know, the best in the world at their areas of specialty. It's financial crime or you know, they know everything about Urdu culture and language or you know, whatever their area is. They are the best at that. But very often they're not the best at technology, cryptography, virtualization, all the things you need to do to operate successfully online. And sometimes the instincts for what works in the physical world fail to transpose to cyberspace. And so having the right kind of tool set and training can make a huge difference in making sure that you're successful. It also is inherently collaborative and cross-jurisdictional. Because people are often committing crimes from somewhere far remote from where they're actually working and often bouncing their traffic across off intermediary points in between. And it may involve sort of cybercrime people and finance crime people and drug people and international issues and international law enforcement groups. It requires a very collaborative approach to trying to solve these problems. You're going to need to be bringing in experts and support from all over the place to try to track these people down. In fact, there's an idea that the criminals use called jurisdictional arbitrage. Right? They will intentionally pick locations for their traffic to come from that are mutually hostile with their target country, where there aren't sort of mutual assistance treaties, because that slows the whole process down as much as possible. All right, so having motivated why we think it's important to be uh, doing online investigations and what the risks are, what, what the, what's different about that environment. Let's look at, and this is sort of my, my choice of what the top 10 things to be thinking about and to know when you're engaging in these online investigations. And obviously, there's thousands of things to know and think about. But I think these top 10, if you can get all of these going for your investigations, will take you a long ways. And number one is security. When you're going out there and engaging online, particularly if it's a, a interactive engagement with your target, you're absolutely opening yourself up to uh, incidental malware or more importantly, counterattack. We've seen denial of service attacks. We've seen intentional uh, probing for hacking. We've seen pushing malware to people. When you're online in an investigative capacity, you're really putting your organization at substantial risk. So it's important that whatever environment you're doing those investigations in has security far above and beyond the normal security that you already have in place on your desktops or your laptop devices. Those things need to be locked down absolutely and make sure that you're protecting your data, your networks, and your infrastructure. You don't want to leak any of your sensitive data and you don't want to let any of these people get inside your organization where they can wreak havoc. The next issue is compliance. And often there's a lot of existing infrastructure and support for ensuring compliance and oversight and auditability 
of operations in the physical world. But online, it gets very complicated, especially because we see very often the solution to operating online is someone gets a dedicated laptop, which they then hook up to either a cell phone connection or get a separate uh, internet connection. And then they do their operations on that. Well, then there's no ability for their supervisors to see what are they doing? What sites are they going to? What did they say? Did they behave properly? Did, is there good um, practice involved in all of that? Are they following all of the rules? And can you document all of that and prove that they were acting appropriately? So making sure from the beginning that your systems are architected to support that, right? You, when someone's going out anonymously and engaging, the system needs to be at the same time capturing all of that activity somehow and storing it in a safe way so that you can go back and look at it and have that oversight and ensure that kind of compliance. This turns out to be uh, tricky, but almost everyone we work with, it's critically important. And along with that is documentation and chain of custody of evidence. Again, in the physical world, we have a lot of standard practices, right? You get a pile of documents and you photograph them all, or you photocopy them all. You get a, a gun and you drop it in a bag with a note about how it was collected, and it's taped shut until a person you know, cuts it open under certain circumstances, or each step of that is defined and controlled. Online, it gets much messier. You've got people printing screens out and, okay, when did you print that screen out? And where were you? And how did you get to that screen? Making sure that, how do I know you didn't alter that, right? It's a PDF. Someone could have gone in and Photoshopped a new version of the screen and then saved it off as a PDF. You want to be able to prove, especially when you're being cross-examined, that that's not what happened. You want to make sure that you can say, here's the exact flow that happened to get to this page. It was printed off. At the moment it was printed off, we forensically hashed it. The hash was saved over here. The document you're seeing still matches that exact hash. So coming up with a workflow and a process and the necessary tools surrounding that to ensure that you can prove exactly how everything was collected and how it was stored and how it got from point A to point B to the final presentation uh, really makes it uh, much more effective. fourth thing is OPSEC, operational security. And this is, in fact, where we most often see things falling down is, you know, it's that moment when you realize that you forgot to turn on the VPN before you went and chatted with your target or you logged in with the wrong account or you were using email address A, but you signed your message as alias B. Right? It's so easy. There's so many ways for human error to creep, creep into these things. And perfect OPSEC is unfortunately both required and virtually impossible. Over and over, we've seen criminals get caught by exactly this. Uh, the dread pirate Roberts, uh, who was running the Silk Road underground marketplace, got caught apparently because he had early on in his career had some accidents where he was cross-using accounts or account names uh, that tripped him up. We look at the hacks against the Democratic National Committee, the hacker named Guccifer 2.0, who claimed to be an independent hacker, except one time he forgot to turn on the commercial VPN he'd been using, and the exposed IP address that came through was a Russian GRU operations center, one of their IP addresses, making pretty compelling case that that's who was doing the, uh, the hacks. They'd been suspected before, but that really gave much more evidence. So there's a need for a kind of user proofing. The tools you're using need to be really convenient so people aren't encouraged to bypass them and they need to be easy to use. And so the tools are the next thing. Think about the tools that you're gonna use when you're going out there, because that can make all the difference. Some tools make things possible at all, right? They allow you to access the dark net or they allow you to forensically capture your documents. Some other tools may be making things efficient, it can be incredibly labor intensive going out and, for example, on a large website, capturing every single page out of some huge, say, drug catalog on an offshore drug store. But the right tool can make that a single click of a button to suck down an entire site. It can also be there to keep you safe. Right? The right tools can make sure that your investigation environment are separated from your desktop, from your local network, from your uh, back end systems.
For example, things like developer mode in your browser allows you to expect, inspect the internals of websites, not just what's surface visible. You could see where are they sourcing their, their code? Where do they get that image? You know, what other kind of building artifacts might be in there that can be useful? You need to be thinking about masking your network identity. And when people think about being anonymous online or trying to be undercover, usually this is where they go first, right? You want to be able to hide where your computer is, right? You don't want someone to see that it's sitting in your office, hanging off a government network. Right? That's going to sort of end things really quick. Uh, given visibility of your real network origin, they can see what's your organization, what's your physical location. They can track patterns of activity. It also is a point for counterattack. They can launch denial of services. They can launch hacking. It's an easy and persistent identifier of who you are. And we see some organizations that will get a single fixed IP address that's not related to them and try to use that on an ongoing basis. And the problem there is while that works once, once you started using that IP address on an ongoing basis, it rapidly becomes associated with who you are. Think about that who's a rat website. So if you have a single alias and you're conducting ongoing operations as that alias, a fixed IP works. But as soon as you have multiple operations, multiple aliases, multiple kinds of activities, the fixed IP address rapidly becomes associated with you and little better than using your official IP addresses. So making sure that you are changing that regularly, that the IP you're using is appropriate to the alias you may be engaging under. Or in fact, if you're doing high volume scraping, like I talked about sucking down an entire website, they may not know who you are, but they might see you visiting them, say, 100,000 times in a couple of hours. So there, you actually need to be thinking about masking yourself with thousands of different masks. So none of them have unrealistic or unusual levels of activity. You also need to think about masking the computer itself. Your system is giving away lots of information that's unique to you. And it's commonly used commercially by advertisers to re-cookie people who've gone in and deleted the cookies off their computers, right? They're trying to assert their privacy, but the advertisers and websites, they still want to be able to track you. Well, just looking at maybe your IP address, but more your system fingerprint, they can reacquire you because it's almost unique in the world for any but the very largest websites. That system fingerprint is completely unique. And it's built off what fonts do you have, what plugins, what versions of the software are you using, what operating system, what kind of screen do you have, what kind of video hardware do you have? And it turns out that's visible to websites. All of this information, and, and also what order did you install them? It's hundreds of little data points that go, go together to build this system fingerprint. And so it's important to hide that. If you're using your desktop machine, you're definitely fingerprinted. If you use the same off-the-shelf computer on a regular basis as a covert machine, it can get fingerprinted and identified. And so that can be a real problem for you. Then we have identity masking. So these are the non-technical details that can give you away. And here we're talking about things like what accounts you use, what account names, what backstory do you have that allows you to, to hide? And things like writing style, right? How do you... Uh, communicate with someone. Let me tell a little story about that. I, as an experiment back in the 90s, used an alias on a mailing list, along with being there overtly. And internally, we at Intrepid were doing some experiments and research looking at author identification and writing style. And so I set a challenge because this mailing list had been ar archived. I said, go in there. Here's the account that I was using overtly tell me what my alias was on this mailing list. And they went away for a week, came back and said, well, we've looked at them, you know, here's the rank order of probabilities, but far and away, this one at the top, we're convinced that's you. And bang, they were exactly right. First try, completely nailed me. And I'd been making an effort. And so there's lots of sort of social tells, slang, word use, uh, even things like using the right kind of application. If everyone else is using a particular chat app, you may be using the old person's thing, right? If you're trying to deal with kids and you're using Facebook, you're not going to look right because they've all moved on to the next platform. 
And so think about how you are managing that mask and make sure that it looks appropriate to who you're trying to blend in with and doesn't uh, identify you because of patterns that are consistent with your activities. Which really rolls into thinking about building those personas. So anytime you're engaged beyond just sort of passively looking at websites or a one-shot contact with someone, you need to be thinking about what is that persona? And realistically, you're always doing that because there is no such thing as being anonymous on the internet. You're always showing a huge amount of information to anyone all the time. Even if you're using, say, Tor or some internet anonymity service, if it's a public service, people know what it is. They'll know that you are actively using a privacy service. And that's a tell. It may be appropriate to your persona, right? If you're pretending to be a fairly savvy criminal, using a privacy service might look normal. If you're looking to be sort of a clueless customer uh, trying to see if this website will sell you something inappropriate, well, that doesn't look normal at all. You should be looking like a clueless consumer using ordinary IP addresses. So because everything's visible, and it's going to exist, the key is to be thoughtful about what you do show. Each one of those things you're presenting to the target that they can see, you need to be conscious of making sure that that makes sense with the story you're trying to tell. It's a very uh, intentional activity. And things like profile photos. Is that normal? Do you need a profile photo? Where can you get the profile photo? Right? It can't be you. In fact, you can't just steal a profile photo from someone else either because facial recognition on social media platforms will probably tie it to where you stole it from. And then there's reverse image searches. So if that image exists on the internet anywhere, it's easy to find out. I've had people try to friend me on LinkedIn and claim to be some businessman from some company. And when I did a lookup on the profile photo in their LinkedIn profile, it turned out to be a Getty stock image of some random businessman. So it's pretty easy to uncover those things. We find that often pets or graphical avatars or flags, there's lots of things you can do, which may or may not be a, pro a professionally looking and appropriate to the kind of persona that you're setting up, the kind of account that you're creating. But think carefully about how that will stand up to scrutiny. And also, how do you age it? You don't want your accounts to have all been born yesterday. If your account was only created last week, you probably need to have a really good reason why it was only created last week if you're an adult. Right? Everyone above the age of six now, and many people well below the age of six are violating policies, but have these accounts already set up, already have tons of content on them. And so why don't I have the ability to go in and see uh, your summer vacation from five years ago? You need to make sure you've got an answer to that. And finally, number 10, we're seeing a lot more activity around mobile and two-factor, and you need to be thinking about both of those. In many cases, the people you're communicating with are mobile first, and so they're looking to be doing their activities from mobile phones, from mobile apps. Uh, and if you're not engaged from the app platform, if you're always coming back from a desktop platform, and sometimes that's visible to the target, that's going to look strange. And in addition, many of the websites that you're going to need to be using, particularly the social media platforms, the interactive platforms, are now trying to eliminate fake accounts. And so they're looking to do multi-factor authentication, at least at sign up. So when you sign up for a new Facebook account or a new social media, they want to go in and then have you give them a phone number and text back a confirmation code to it that you'll then enter on the website to prove you're a real person. And they have lists of all of the uh, you know, VoIP phone numbers out there. So many of the tricks that worked in the past for generating phone numbers aren't working anymore. They're really looking to see that you've got a real cell phone with a real cell phone number to do those kind of confirmations to set up that account. So that's the top 10 things. So security compliance, chain of custody, OPSEC tools, network masking, system masking, identity masking, persona building, and mobile and two-factor authentication support. If you think about all 10 of those and get an answer and a solution to each of those, I think you're going to be a long way ahead in your investigations. So at the end of the day, there's a lot similar about online and conventional investigations. Right? Many of the same practices and techniques still apply, but it introduced lots of new ways for things to go wrong that a lot of people aren't as familiar with. Tools, I think, are the 
one of the critical factors for safety, effectiveness, and efficiency. That, together with training, to help the folks who are not necessarily experts in this space learn the proper techniques, practices, OPSEC, uh, will, will ensure that they're not going to accidentally trip over their own feet or shoot themselves in the foot when they're online. So with those 10, con those 10 concepts, I think you're way ahead of the game and way ahead of most other people that we've seen doing online investigations. We've been providing tools for these kind of investigations for over 20 years. So we're here to help with capabilities, platforms, and advice. Uh, if you're interested in this, you want to reach out, we really encourage you to do so. I'm Lance Cottrell, Chief Scientist uh, at Intrepid, and I encourage you to reach out to me directly if you have technical questions, or if you want more general information about the kinds of things we can do, you can email solutions at Intrepid Corp, or just go to our website uh, at intrepidcorp.com. And so thank you very much. I think we'll uh, throw it open to questions. So there is a question section in the app uh, if you want to uh, ask any. I can see we're getting a couple of them here. So the first question is, how much does something like this cost? How realistic is this with an OIG budget? I think the, the, the problem with trying to give you just a number off the top of my head is there are a huge number of moving parts, uh, depending on what kind of threat model you're engaging with. Is this a one shot? Is this you know, requiring deep cover? How sophisticated are your opponents going to be? Right? What kind of scrutiny does it need to stand up to? Is someone just going to kind of look at their own web logs? Or is someone going to go to the ISP we're going out through and try to break kneecaps, right? You know, that, that requires vastly different levels of backstopping. But suffice it to say, we work with large and small uh, organizations in the government and in private sector. Uh, and there is a whole range of solutions that will fit kind of any uh, budget range. So someone's asking, how do we deal with oversight and audit issues? Uh, so with our tools, at least, we are running all of the activities inside a dedicated virtual environment so that we have total control over it and we can instrument it. So we're actually capturing all of the user activity and then feeding it up into a secure cloud where the supervisors can look at it. So every single click, every email the user sends, every web page they goes to, we're actually snapshotting the entire page, automatically capturing every URL. Uh, in real time so that you, without any effort, get that entire history of all the user activity right there. And then you can decide, do you keep that? Or if that wasn't important, you can delete it later. But it makes it very easy to have that um, information at your fingertips as a supervisor. And someone's asking about the standalone laptop issue that I touched on earlier. One of the things about standalone laptops is that it's not easy to get back to a known clean state. So they have their system fingerprint, that system fingerprint is consistent, and you start getting things like cookies and worse super cookies, uh, which utilize other mechanisms to store data on your computer, but aren't deleted when you tell your browser to scrub the cookies. Uh, they can get infected with malware and the good malware gets right past all of the existing anti-malware detection systems. And so you have no idea to whether that, that laptop is clean or safe anymore. Uh, the nice thing about using uh, virtualization is that you can completely destroy the computer at the end of every single session and recreate it from a known good backup. Whereas you know, taking a sledgehammer to your laptop at the end of every session and buying a new one just gets prohibitively expensive. Well, I say, how can you mitigate human error? That's an interesting question. Uh, so there's really two aspects to dealing with the human error problem. One is trying to design your environment to make it unlikely to happen. So the way we try to architect things, for example, is you can't forget to turn on your VPN. Uh, when you're inside our environment, it is always at the VPN and you can't do anything until you actually choose how you want to look, where you want to come out from. It's fundamentally tied together. And we try to provide a lot of context. So 
the browser you're using for your operational activity looks different than the browser you're using on your desktop. It's still you know a standard conventional browser, but we skin it in different colors. Uh, well, when we're doing our desktop environments, you know, there's different backgrounds. There's a little header bar at the top to let you know who you're supposed to be, where you are, what's the time zone there, as much context as we can provide to the user so that they don't accidentally say the wrong thing. You know, we even have systems that will provide things like, what's the weather where you're supposed to be? So that you don't go out and say, oh, yeah, I was playing soccer yesterday when they've just had a freak hailstorm. Uh, you know, all of that helps contribute to preventing human error. And then, of course, training. People need to understand how things can fail so that they're aware of the kind of best practices that will help prevent them from tripping over their own feet. Thanks for listening to the Intrepid Cast. Our videos are available on our YouTube channel and on our website at intrepidcorp.com media. If you enjoyed this, please subscribe and give us a review. Our audio podcasts are available through iTunes, Stitcher, and from our website. And we blog at intrepidcorp.com slash blog. Until next time, ciao.